Good evening. It's now 7 p.m. and I would like to start the meeting of the Housing Overview and Scrutiny Committee. I'd like to remind everyone present that this meeting is being recorded. Item number one, apologies for absence. I've received apologies from Councillor Churchman. Don't believe there's any further because everybody else is here. Um, thank you. So item two, minutes of the previous meeting. I move that the minutes of the Housing Overview and Scrutiny Committee held on the 29th of September 2022 be approved as correct record. Does any member have any comments on the minutes? No. Thank you, they're, so they're approved. Thank you. Item three, I, urgent items of business. So I've not agreed to any items of urgent business. Item four, declarations of interest. Does anyone wish to declare a declaration of interest? No. Thank you. Can I just, uh, as Black Shots is on there, I'm the ward councillor, it just pays me to, you know, Say I am. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Redsell. So moving on to item five, fees and charges, pricing strategy 2023-4. Uh, can I ask allow Ahmed to present the report via Microsoft Teams? Thank you. Hi, I'm not sure if you can hear me. I think you're on mute at the moment. Good evening, Chair and Councillor members. I can't um, see the panel. Can you hear, can you hear well, us? I will do, I'll just carry on. Um, I'm Dilaw Ahmed. I'm the private housing enforcement manager for the private housing team. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole report in full, but what I will do, I will um, highlight the key points for this committee to know. So in terms of the background of the report, the report consists almost wholly of private housing, statutory and discretionary services. Our service aims to recover its full cost on services provided to landlords. Uh, and this money is ring fenced to fund team's cost. Secondly, we compare our costs in comparison to other local authorities to ensure that those costs and charges are fair, transparent, and reasonable. Main points in the 23-24 fees report are HMO licensing fees will increase by 11%. We have removed the discount for accredited landlords. This has previously caused confusion and delays to process application forms. We have also introduced a new three-year HMO license fee to be issued in certain circumstances to improve housing and property standards. There are uh, 221 HMOs in the public register and we estimate there are around 630 unlicensed HMOs. Over the last three years, we have uh, collected in uh, 80,000 pounds in 2020-21, and in 21-22, 31,000. And this year, at the end of October, we've collected 23,000. In terms of housing enforcement notices, this notice requires the person or land or landlord to carry out a remedial action within a certain time to remove the or reduce the hazard. Part one notice fee has been restructured to reflect the average time and resources for carrying out this function. This is a change in our charging policy. Previously, we, we counted the unit size and the number of hazards to, to, to impose a to impose the fee, for example, on a two bedroom property, and if there was one to four hazard, we would, for example, charge £465. And for a two bed, and if there were five or more hazards, that fee would reflect the time and cost £570. So that, that, that's uh, one of the main changes to the housing enforcement notice policy. Uh, we've also introduced a works in default charge, and this is a new charge 
it's supplied in certain situations if there's imminent risk to health and safety and when there's undue delay and it would put the occupier at risk if not remedied. The proposed charging policy is to recover the full cost of the works plus 20% admin fee to cover the cost of the works, to, oh, sorry, to oversee the works. Uh, this is comparable to other local authorities. Penalty charges under the Housing Plan Act 2016. These charges remain the same uh, to impose civil penalties of up to £30,000 as an alternative prosecution. Uh, the council uses a matrix to calculate the cost to the landlord and considers their mitigating factors to improve a civil penalty notice. The matrix is made up of a penalty charge, aggregating factors and mitigating factors. Our CPN income of the last three years has been £82,000 in 2021, in 2021-22 £72,000 and in 2022-23 this year at the end of October, we've generated £76,000. In terms of energy efficiency regulations, smoke carbon monoxide alarm and electrical safety uh, standards, there's no change to these penalty charges under these regulations. These are uh, set by government. Then finally, mobile licence uh, fees. The licence fees are to remain the same. These are broadly in line with other local authorities. And on the council's uh, license, uh, caravan license register, we have four license holders, and that consists of three caravan sites and one park home. Happy to take uh, any questions in relation to the report. Thank you for your report. Uh, Councillor Redsell. Thanks, Councillor. Thanks, Chairman. Um, Delal, thanks for the thanks for the report. Um, just going on the fees and charges I think if um, general public read that out there they won't know what the what it is about you know I and mean, it takes us enough to look at this and and find out why and what I mean if general public read that I shouldn't think they'd know what was happening you know where it's got everything removed and so I, th I think they'd have a bit of trouble with that and there's not a lot to explain it to them um, just to pick up on the mobile homes, um, do you not think as we've got mobile homes now coming into the borough, we should be looking at that again? We're getting new mobile homes coming into the borough, so should it be something that we should be looking at? Thank you. Hi, uh, um, just asking online, can you hear us, uh, Delal? I, I can. Yeah. Okay. Council of Mays. Can you hear me? What, you didn't hear me before? Can you hear me now, Dalau? Yeah, yeah, I can yeah. hear you now. Okay, shall I go again then? Yes. Oh, yes, please. Okay, just saying about the fees and charges um, that are in there. It takes us a while to understand it. General public have to understand this. I think there perhaps should have been something with it to explain it to people how it works because I think if they're going to read that just ordinary residents out there they're not going to understand it um, not that they have to but I think they, they need to know more about it and why um, the other thing was mobile homes as we've got a lot of mobile homes coming into the borough on planning applications now should we be looking at that again so in in terms of um, mobile park homes uh, they normally go through our planning team, like you said, and once they've been granted planning, then our team would go out and make sure that they meet with our licensing conditions, which are model standards set by the government. Thank you. Uh, what, what was the second part of your question, please, Councillor Redsell? The first one about the fees and charges. Okay, so in terms of, I, I missed the, the first part of the question, sorry, Could you, if you repeat again for me. Just the fees and charges, Dalau. Us, us as members can probably understand this more than most, but I think even we have a small problem with some of it. 
But our residents, this is out for general public to look at. Do you not think there should be something in there just to explain it a bit more to them? Yeah, uh, thank you for that feedback, uh, Council. We, we, we can look at the format and the structure and see what we can do for next year. So it's more uh, in more plain English or, or the, have a, maybe an explanation of, uh, of, of the table, if that helps. Thank you, Dillow. Um, yes, I, I, I agree that actually all of these things should be able to be read by all of our residents, not those that um, look, want to look into it further and, and know a bit more. This should be easy to, easy, every uh, document that we have should be easy to pick up and understand in layman's terms and not, um, and not difficult. Uh, Councillor Hebb first. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thanks to Lael for the report and the introduction. Can I just clarify? The two-page staple document is Appendix 1, and the second one is Appendix 2, the single page. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Am I right in saying, because going on Councillor Redsell's point just a small while ago, I think the, the gap that's always been present on fees and charges is the lack of clarity on who the target audience is. Can I just clarify that all of the fees and charges that are on these two appendices are targeted towards landlords uh, and not private housing users? That's correct, it's handled. Thank you. Um, and just one other thing on, on that particular front. The thing with these reports is they don't overly contextualise the volume of use. You've given us some figures around 86,000, 76,000, everything else. But, you know, if you look at the commentary within the report, what I'm not clear on is what is the actual total income per fee line? What are the total number of transactions per fee line? Because, you know, when you say about 11%, that sounds quite a big number, but if it's 11% of one or two users out of 180,000 residents in the borough, that sets a very different context. So have we got those numbers available, please? Sorry, uh, I don't have the broken objective line, but in terms of uh, if, 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 we, if we talk about HMO license fees, so I said that there was 80,000 pounds generated in 2021, uh, 31,000 in 21, 22, and, 20, and in 22, 23 to date, it's 23,000. The average license fee is is just over 1,000, say, uh, 300 pounds. So what, what, what we've seen is in the last three years, a decline in the number of license application forms. However, what we have seen is in the number of landlords that we're detecting unlicensed has increased. So our CPN income has gone up as a result. Thank you. Councillor Warren. And also, in terms of like housing enforcement notices, I'm really uh, I sorry. can give you the... I'm really sorry online. I thought you'd finished then. Please continue. Sorry. Uh, I, just, I just wanted to add, Councillor, that in terms of our improvement notices, uh, I can also give you those numbers. So in, in 2021, we served a total of 17 improvement notices and then in 21-22 we served 36 and in 22-23 this year at the end of October we've served 10. So what I can see in terms of uh, housing enforcement we have seen an increase in number of complaints being made to the team. We've had to do more education and more enforcement action as a result of a uh, number of landlords not carrying out works within agreed specified times. We've had to extend landlords more time to carry out works because of the problem with the pandemic and the lack of materials and, and other reasons, mitigating reasons. Councillor Hebb, did you want to come back on that one? Thank you, that's really helpful. And I, I think my point was a wider point, and you've answered it, like you say, it's, it, it does say partly in here already what you've just said. Um, that is really helpful context. I, I, just think, I think my observation is more around the fees and charges st structure, if that makes sense. But, you know, the, the answer you've given a, a sound. It's, I wondered if there was the responses for the other ones. Just looking at section 5.3 of the report, or paragraph 5.3 rather, it makes commentary around the power to recover all reasonable costs associated with the administration. What, what would not be involved, Lau, in that recovery? 
So we would cover, is, is this in relation to works in default? 5.3. Uh, it's on page 16, uh, paragraph 5.3. Is that right? Is that, you got, yeah, it's not just me, is it? Yeah, 5.3, 5, 5 16. It makes a comment that the Housing Act gives councils to recover all reasonable costs. And I'm just curious as to what, what would you consider not reasonable to recover? So in terms of what would be unreasonable to cover, that would be for uh, officer time that's unrelated to that, to, in relation office time unrelated to the, the activity. So, for example, if we had an admin officer that was unrelated to carrying out that particular function in terms of the preparation of service of the notice, we couldn't include their cost or time. Thank what you. What the council is not able to do is, is generate extra income and charge unreasonable fees. What, what we have found is that uh, where we are serving notices or dealing with CPN uh, fines, we often have uh, landlords that are unhappy with receiving a notice and we have to deal with those appeals through the tribunal and the tribunal would look at what our, our fee policy, look at the breakdown of our fee charges and then they would question whether those fees are relevant or whether we've just whether the council has added extra fee charges which are not reasonable in relation to that function or activity so this is why it's really really important for the council to be very transparent and clear and provide a breakdown of all its service and functions thank you delal for that uh, councillor warren thank you chair um and thank you for your report tonight um, I've got a few questions, um, so uh, probably just one at a time. Uh, is there a landlord group that you consult with about the increases? You know, um, is there a working group? You know, because I kind of feel like we've just gone, well, inflation's 11%, we'll just increase it by 11%. Have our charges actually gone up by 11%? Um, or is it just a straight inflation's that so we're going to increase it was there no wriggle room and I ask this because I worry that these costs are just going to go straight on to the the people that are renting those rooms in those HMOs so uh, we we had landlord uh, forum event prior to uh, probably prior to this report being produced for the uh, for the for the housing ONS and we we presented that well, we we showcased what the new charges would be during that event. So there was that element of discussion with some landlords who attended that event. In the future, we will be engaging more closely with the National Resident Landlord Association, um, which will uncover a broad range of housing issues in relation to landlord engagement, uh, fees and charges, HMO licensing, so on. Okay, so, so probably not a lot of landlords know that this is coming then. Is that fair to say that? Oh, sorry, I missed that, Councillor Worrell. Oh, sorry. So, so is it fair to say that more landlords don't know than do know that this 11% in, this, um, increase is coming their way? I would say they, uh, well, we've got a, a second event planned on December the 5th. We have a H it's designed and aimed at HMO landlords. So we'll be picking it up again there with our HMO landlords. Thank you. Um, and uh, so we've got 221 registered HMOs. Did I catch that right? And how many we unlicensed did. do we believe we there is? We guesstimate there's around about 630. Right, about 630. So I think I remember the last time this report came here, we asked that officers were targeted with increasing the numbers that we actually licensed um, because we've known for s some years that these um, HMOs are out there and unlicensed. And there's a lot of money going in this year, isn't there? Um, so what is being done to source these unlicensed and um, are we improving year on year the amount that we are licensing? 
in terms of the last uh, two years, we've seen a decrease in the number of license application forms. The, and part of that reason has been that we've we've had a decrease in staff and in, in members of the team that carry out the licensing function. So that's been one uh, cause. Uh, however, we what we have seen is an increase in the number of unlicensed properties that we've detected and we've had to serve civil penalties for failure to license voluntarily. So in terms of what actions we're doing to detect unlicensed HMO, we have a program of going through electoral uh, role records. We look at council tax and we look at the council's housing uh, waiting list application for shared for people that are registered under shared accommodation. We also have a campaign of public reporting unlicensed HMOs as well as councillors. We've managed to successfully detect a number of unlicensed HMOs. So that it's, it's an ongoing programme. Dilau, are you still running short of staff? And if so, how many staff are we short in your team that would be doing this job, say, pre-COVID up until now? You know, um, are you yeah, still so running short? We are. It's, it's, we're, we're one officer short. Okay, thank you. Um, and I do have another question on in the recommendations in 1.1. 1 .1, it says um, the revised fees, including those no longer applicable, are the no longer applicable just been moved across, or have we got rid of some fees and charges that were part of this um, fees and charges? Because I remember last time, I think, that we wiped some off and they went elsewhere. I just wondered if that's happened again this time. Yes. So in terms of uh, this year, we've, we have removed accredited landlord fee. So that, that, that's been removed. We just now have one fee, which is more clearer to landlords and reduces any confusion. So, there's, so that, that those fees have completely been removed. So it's now one licence fee for the, not one, but licence fees for the bedroom sizes. Okay, thank you. For that. Sorry, two, two seconds, uh, Evelina. Um, Councillor Wall, can you hear me okay? Yep. So the other fee that uh, was removed last time, last year, we were putting it into the HRA rent setting report because it was not general fund, it was HRA, it shouldn't have made it there. Thank you. Um, Councillor Redsell. Thank you, Chair. Um, Dalau, just going, Councillor Worrell's asked a couple of questions. With a HMOs, was I right in hearing 630, you said? Unlicensed. Unlicensed. Estimated. Yeah, we, we, we guessed them, yeah. 630. Estimated 630 in the borough. Um, I won't comment on that. Um, just to say that uh, if I remember rightly, and probably Councillor Worrell will tell me if I'm wrong, but we asked to have a ward um, to let us know how many was in each ward, because I think I was the first one to pick the HMOs out when we first had them in, and they keep coming up at planning with eight houses in one street, and I think that needs to be looked at. Um, we never actually got that... Um, information for ward issues. We need to know where the HMOs are because sometimes we get more um, antisocial behaviour from them. I know I did in my ward and I haven't got that many. But I think once they start coming through and if we've got unlicensed there, we don't know they're there either. So I think it needs to be more addressed than it is. That would worry me, that 630 unlicensed. Thank you. Councillor Hebb. Delau. Oh, sorry, Councillor Red. Sorry. Sorry, um, Delau, can you answer the question of uh, Councillor Redsell, please? Can do. So, Councillor Redsell, uh, we do have a, a public register that contains the list of all HMOs and their addresses. We can uh, populate that on, on, on a map and have the boundaries, boards, so that it's more clear and visible to uh, members, if that helps, or we can get that sent over to, to 
housing ONS and to all councillors if, 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 if that's what you wanted in that format. What we can't share with you is obviously the list of uh, unlicensed HMOs because the team is working to identify whether that they are licensable HMOs. I know you're one, I know you're one short of staff, but I still don't think that's good enough, Jalal. We, we've got 630 unlicensed premises in Farrock and we've no way of finding out where they are. I think it's so wrong. Um, yes, I would like something sent out to us, as all ward members, I'm sure we would. Um, I think it's something we need to know. We need to know where they are, um, because sometimes they haven't even got anybody looking after them within the houses, and they're 16 years old. Mm. I've had it in my ward, where we've got 16-year-olds hanging out the windows and running up and down the street at 3 o'clock in the, in the evening or early morning. So I think we need to have this... This needs to be looked at you know, if it's just one staff short, perhaps we need to pull staff in from somewhere else and have a really good go at it. But I'd recommend that we look at this, please. Thank you. Yes, uh, Delal, if you could send that out to, to us, I think that would be uh, good. And I do think we need to spotlight this because I think uh, 630 is... is Chair, ama amazing. If we know that there's 630, yeah. we should be... Tar we should go after them. Yeah. Sorry, Councillor Redsell. Can I just come... Yeah, we've, we've got obviously 5.8 on page 16, Dalau. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, yes, Councillor, I yeah. can. It says the following list contains examples of grant three-year licences. Surely that's too long because a lot can happen in that three years that you don't know about. So I think, is this coming from government or is this coming from the council? In licensing. So, uh, just to go, can I just go back and answer the original question around different types of HMOs, if, if that's helpful to put some context to what you just said. So, in terms of the H, the six hundred and thirty, our team licensed the uh, for under the mandatory and additional licensing. There was a, a more recently some government funding that we were unsuccessful in securing, and that was for supported housing. Now, th there are a number of properties that may be exempt from licensing because they fall under uh, a, a support care environment. But, what, but our plan is that we would be working more closely with supported housing to look at those care homes to make sure that they're properly managed and have in place the proper... Um, property standards within the dwellings. So it, it, it's work in progress in terms of policing those HMOs which may be exempt from licensing currently. However, the government is looking at this whole area of care and support and HMOs. So it may be a regulatory function that falls within uh, licensing next year. I don't, I don't, sorry Chair, I don't know why they should be exempt from licensing. I mean, if we've got 630, we, we know there's roughly 630, but we still don't know really. It could be more than that, couldn't it? Um, I, just, I just feel that that three-year licence, you're leaving that open to something going wrong, especially if we've got 16-year-olds in there. I think it, it probably should be a, a year licence we give them. Yeah, uh, noted, Councillor Redsill. We, we're proposing uh, a three-year license. Uh, you have a five-year license, which is the uh, one that the government recommend. We're proposing a three-year license for the reasons that have been outlined, so that we can properly manage those uh, poor landlords that have been causing problems in local neighbourhoods. Uh, if, if we were to introduce a one-year license, which which is within our gift to do so. Um, we don't have enough sufficient uh, admin resources to manage that process. And what we don't want to do is call an extra burden on landlords by charging a 12-month fee and then for them to extend it and charge another, another fee on top of that. So to be fair um, and balanced, if, if three years is, is halfway between a five-year and a, and, and, and a, and a one-year, you, you could argue. Thank you, Dalal. I, I 
I do th take your point on that because three years is a long time, lots can change. Actually, I think having the discretion if there's concern um, to, to move that to a year would be uh, something that we should look at regardless of capacity because the safety of, of residents has is, is got to be a priority for us. So um, I'd like to, to if, if you would uh, be happy with that, put that as a recommendation that we'd recommend that actually we'd have a, a one year option, not necessarily used as default, but certainly have it there, not just a, a blanket three year, because that's concerning. Uh, Councillor Hebb. Just on that chair, I noticed that some of the subsequent committees are relatively like the work programme. I just wonder, is it worth, because the, the issue here is we're getting into strategy, not just the, the pricing mechanism against each respective budget line or coded line. Um, I wonder, with respect, whether we ask for a paper to come on the strategy around HMOs, because I, I, unless I've missed anything, colleagues, I can't see anything prior or just coming. It just seems to be worth bringing it here, because there will be legitimate reasons why 12 months aren't the right thing. Possibly. I don't know. But um, that wasn't what I was going to ask, by the way. <laughs> I just hope you don't mind my asking. No, no, I'll, I'll take your point with that. Actually, we can discuss it on the work programme and, and put that, um, I think there's the space on there, so we can put that there. So, uh, Councillor, did you have a question you wanted to come in on this one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got it in there. No, not quite. Um, Delau, quick question. Um, section 5.7, um, how long does it take an officer to process a single application, please? Uh, to process uh, this HMO license application, looking at 5.7. Correct. So the, the, the payment is split into two parts, the admin process and then the visit and then the uh, looking at the license conditions, producing license. So you're probably looking in, in the whole process, you probably would look at around about 10 hours. 10 hours, you say? Yeah, if you, if, if you add everything from the beginning process in terms of the application, checking the application, looking at uh, the, you know, checking, making sure all the documentation that they've been requested with the application is provided, you know, sending out letters, postage, processing it on the, you know, on, onto our database, from doing the property inspection, giving advisory uh, recommendations to the landlord, to going back and checking the work. So on the current trajectory then, it's gonna take about 102 weeks to get through this potential 400 backlog. So in terms of the 630 that I've guesstimated, that, that's a, that's a program of uh, inquiries that we have, that one we're following up, because apart from doing the physical check, there are a number of back office checks that we have to carry out to make sure that it is a, a licensable HMO or it, or it fits under our additional licensing scheme. It's it's in terms of like having officers going out and doing 630 visits, it's not always a good use of staff time because there are, there are a number of ways you can eliminate a number of properties through that process, which we have been doing. I think um, perhaps part of the, thank you for the response, by the way. Um, I think perhaps part of the work program needs to have that as a particular conversation. No, I, I agree on, in, with that statement. Uh, Councillor Lydiard, I think we'll have, uh, if we can just try and have Thanks, a couple Chair. more questions on this, just because of time Th for the rest Thanks, of it. Thanks, for your reports. Just wondering, um, of the 630 unlicensed premises, what was that mean in terms of lost revenue? So if, if you were to multiply 630 times the cost of a licence fee, so I just, I just... Just bear with me while I get my calculator out and work it out for you. You're looking just over eight hundred thousand pounds. That's over three years, is it? Uh, the the last fee has to be paid in advance. It's two okay. part payment, but uh, once we're satisfied that it meets with the criteria, 
then we and you've carried out the works, then we issue the, you the license. Thanks very much. Uh, Councillor Warren. Thank you. It's a really quick one, Chair. Um, on the um, removed list, um, the sheltered housing visitors' room has been removed, it says on there, and dispersed a lifeline. Um, but I can't see it on the new list, so has it gone somewhere? Um, thank you. This is the HRA element that will go into the HRA rent setting report. Thank you. Um, thank you, members, for your question, and thank you, Delal, for your report. Um, so, I think the I think we discussed about the one year adding the one year uh, option in as a recommendation um, because I think the three years is 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 far too long just to leave something just because it's convenient. Uh, and I get there's operational reasons, and I think a, a strategy that we could look at and see why we think three years is fine. Um, but based on what we've got here tonight, I think one year an option needs to happen. So can we add that into as a recommendation, please? Um, I'm not sure either wording would go with that, but what's that, sorry? Brilliant, so if uh, we add that one year um, option for HMO licensing, is all members in agreement of the recommendations on the report? Thank you. Um, thank you, Delal. Um, you're free to leave the meeting now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just as a point of uh, thought process, I'm really not a fan of virtual meetings like this. I think oh, I've got to be all in, in person or not at all. I think from future meetings, I really don't want to receive a report like this. I don't think any of us have have enjoyed this at all and it really does slow down and make the process really muddled so yeah moving forward um if we can have them in physical rather than that sorry sorry Evelyn. Cherry, if, if my if i may um do i was absolutely going to be here in person he's been not feeling well over the last few days and he requested uh, uh permission in writing uh via jenny today um if he could attend in um via teams that was not the desire and not something that he wanted, but um, in the circumstances, I thought it was right to ask Jenny, um, obviously, of yourself. Thank you. I, I didn't see if that was an email or not, but no, I, I, I think moving forward, even if permission is requested, I think it's just it just doesn't work. I think it, it's, and I understand, I mean, I wish, wish uh, Delel, um, you know, speedy recovery from, from illness, but I think in this case, we can't be, um, I mean, it's taken a lot longer than it would have been if they was physically in person. So, yeah, I think uh, moving forward, I'd, I'd, I would like to see that. So, item six, the Housing Ombudsman report, spotlight on damp and mould. Can Mohammed please re uh, present your report? Thank you, Chair. Uh, good evening, Committee. Uh, my name is Mohammed Shahidullah. I'm the Housing Plan Maintenance and Repairs Manager for the Housing Service. Um, this evening's report that's been presented to committee uh, follows on the back of the Ombudsman Service, Housing Service report that was published last October, October 21, which is Spotlight Reporting Damp and Mould. And this evening's report is highlighting how we are uh, addressing the 26 recommendation, uh, recommendations within the Ombudsman's uh, report there. This report also follows on from two previous reports that have been presented to committee, I think in June 2021 and November 2021, which highlighted how we're addressing damp and mould management within our social housing stock. Um, I would like committee to note that this report was written prior to the tragic event in Rochdale, uh, and I'm sure my director later will have uh, some comments to make upon that. There are key learnings to come out of that, and the, uh, the coroner's report, which we have all received and we're examining and reviewing in light of our own approach and practices in the authority. Um, I welcome any, I won't say any much further there. You know, I've, I've made my recommendations clear in the report to you. So I welcome any comments and queries from you. Do you want to come on us? I really just uh, wanted to say that we obviously take the uh, coroner's findings very seriously. We've um, 
Uh, I mean, we think that we've already got a very proactive approach, but we absolutely understand there will be a lot of um, probably um, cases that, we're in, that are not on our radar. So we're also checking um, about how the information travels between us and different players in the system. So we obviously look at GPs and other visitor, uh, visiting offices, our own contractors that visit properties uh, often, uh, uh, quite often, sometimes more often than us. So um, just really um, put uh, together a, a task and finish group and uh, looking also at our wider partners and other housing associations that operate within the borough. So it's not just our stock, but across the stock. Thank you for that. Uh, do any members wish to speak? So, uh, Councillor Redsell. Thank you, Chair. I perhaps don't think I should, actually. I might say something I don't want to say, but I think reading this, this is scathing. You know, if, if this is what's happening, I think in our borough too, Evelina, sorry to go against you, but I, I think on page 49 when it says, be in a reasonable state of repair, what's reasonable? You know, we've got it in the Black Shots Flats, which is going to come up later anyway. We have had that. I've been fighting that for the last 20 years, and I'm sick of it, to be honest. Mm. And, and I think we're asking people to live in places which they shouldn't be in. And obviously I'll have more to say later on, but I, I just think if you've really read this, and I hope members have yeah. completely read this, because this is terrible. If we are asking people to live in these <coughs> conditions... And we have got it in our borough. And we yeah. ought to be really ashamed that we've got it in our borough because we've let it go on for too long. And I think when we can do, we can do something about it. We should have done something about it a long time ago. Um, some of these buildings were built too long ago and they are just falling about. But I think probably I'll wait till later on to say all I want to say. But I just felt like I should, you know, when they say should be in a reasonable state of repair. No, they should be in good repair. You know, if you're in your own home, you expect to have decent and good... If you're a landlord, you're expected to have... We haven't got landlords that are good all, most of the time, but if you're a good landlord, you should keep your house. Mm. And there are really a lot of good landlords out there who do look after their property. It, at the end of the day, it's their property. And if they later on want to sell it on, it should be in good repair not reasonable state of repair. So, thank you. don't know if you wanted to answer that at all. No? Right, okay. Yeah, I know, I know some specific cases that we've, we've worked on for housing, um, especially with a later, later uh, point in the agenda. So, um, we'll, leave, we'll leave that from there. Uh, but, uh, Councillor Worrell. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, so I think like we have to, you know, accept that um, the, the judge's ruling last week and and go, you know, um, setting out a very very stern message to councils. And damp and mould is something that I've been fighting for the last as long as I've been a councillor. Fifteen years before I was a councillor, I think it was one of the reasons I got into wanting to stand for a council. Um, I mean, I lived in a flat in Tilbury I don't know, 25 years ago and I had damp and mould so God knows what they're like with them same storage eaters them same economy seven storage eaters are still in them flats now you know we've just got around to doing the Chadwell ones and there was damp and mould there then so um, so it's on page 32 it says that we've got 18 properties were known to have ongoing issues of damp and mould. So we've got some quite high numbers where we know that there is reoccurring damp and mould. Um, do are we confident that we can sit here tonight saying that we haven't got any homes in the state of repair that you would go in and it's up the walls, across the ceiling, across the kitchen, across the bedrooms? You know, we haven't got. Are you confident that we haven't got children? living in bedrooms with bronchitis because of what we have put them in? And have we got any live court cases against us, um, like medical cases through the doctors? Um, and is anybody like taking any action against us because of the conditions that we've 
um, that we've left them living in. I know that we had like Dee Lodge for some years, you know, she led the, the damp and mould campaign, um, which really spiralled us into doing some work. I just wonder if out of that, you know, we've still got cases running in the background. Thank you, Councillor Wall. Um, just your latter point about the legal disrepair cases, the live cases we have ongoing. I attend we weekly meetings where we review our current track of all the known properties where our residents have sought legal recourse. We're trying to resolve those sort of current cases that we have. We go back and re-inspect, re-survey and try to treat and resolve the matters before it gets to uh, a tribunal hearing or to a point where a compensation offer has to be made. Sometimes we're in the hands of, obviously, if we're in the hands of their legal representatives and, and solicitors, so correspondence exchanges, time delays, whereas really what we want to do as an authority is meet with our residents, visit, re-inspect, survey, treat and resolve. You know, this is the type of action plan that we want to put in place. Sometimes we, it's not always possible because, like I say, it's down to communicating with their legal representatives. But we do have a legal a disrepair tracker, a live case that we review on a weekly basis. And it's something that's part of our standard practice you know, within the authority at the moment. In terms of... Uh, is that a handful of cases that we've got or is it like a ream of cases that we've got against us? I think well, the last one I was I looked at it last Friday, sort of cognizant of the fact I'll be appearing before you this evening. I think we had live cases, I think I counted something around 20 and something like we're resolving like around a dozen before it gets to any sort of matter of compensation. There are five that are currently, we're waiting, five uh, properties, the residents, we're waiting to have access back into the property so we can re-inspect and offer some sort of treatment. And I think there are three cases that are we're currently with our solicitors that are communicating with the residents' legal representatives. So that just gives you a snapshot if that helps. Okay. It says that we put in for some government um, de housing decarbonation fund. When do we expect to know whether we've got that? And is it a specific program that we'll be running? So the uh, bid submission date was uh, literally last week, so we just put in for it. Um, the government, uh, we think, are, are going to make an announcement sort of earlier in the year because the, the, the conditions of the delivery of the works under the bid um, start from April um, next year. So we are expecting to know by sort of January. We've got good record of that. As you know, we've already um, had funding approved and are delivering on site for for the ground source heat pumps, as, as, as you mentioned. Um, so we were sort of in good place with government in that sort of funding um, stream. So we're very, very hopeful. And, and talking of the heat pumps, um, are they ready? Are they in? You know, um, our travel flats going to be warmer this winter than they were. And where are we with finishing the, the graze blocks? Um, because obviously they had a lot of damp there last year because of the, you know, the, because of the windows not fitting and the cladding was off, you know. So where are we with moving them or are we um, leaving them open to the elements with increased costs again this year? So in terms of the ground source heat pumps, the programme runs until um, end of March. Um, so we are on track in terms of um, the ground, the, the, the actual drilling and then going inside the, the properties. Um, the installs within properties will start, I think, according to programme, sort of any minute now. It might have even started this week. Um, but the, as I say, the programme uh, runs up all the way up until the end of March. So, and we think we are on track. In terms of Grace Towers, um, all of the insulation is on and you might have noticed some kind of whiter looking windows so we're now within properties and now replacing windows and and sort of finishing the works uh, for individual flats uh, that is a slightly longer program um, and I think it runs probably for another sort of year yeah 
uh, but it's obviously it's a lot of work um, there but it's but it's sort of fairly fairly on time following the obviously the the, the initial kind of issues that you know we have encountered and we we um, but we have dealt with so um, uh, we get a lot of good feedback in terms of the temperatures within those properties already so that um, external insulation has already made a difference to residents and just the other day we had the sort of um, uh, uh, contract management meeting where another story was sort of recited from a resident so we're looking to put it into our next housing news as a good story a good news story uh, from from residents and getting some quotes from them but the, the feeling on the ground is that it it has made a huge difference uh, with the sort of the, the the temperatures and I think there was one um, sort of councillors come back to us to say as well that they're having those sort of um, uh, you know bits snippets of information from residents so very very pleased about that thank you uh, I'm just um, asking councillors if we could uh, try and speak into the mics because of where they're pointed away they're not picking up and uh, it's not being recorded properly um, so um, next is Council Lydiard. Thanks, Chair. Thanks for your report. Um, on 4.1, the Ombudsman's recommendations uh, say four key themes. Are we going to adopt that as, as our policy? Because it says from reactive to proactive approach to tackling damp and mould, from inferring blame to taking responsibility, from disrepair claims to resolution, and from a complaint to a learning culture. Because I, I mean, I'm a Tilbury councillor, and am I right in saying that we have probably the oldest properties in the borough, and probably uh, the highest water level in terms of groundwater? So we have particular problems. And I've found, I mean, I've actually seen mould growing half an inch thick under kitchen cabinets and stuff like that. And um, something that, that Councillor Worrell was saying, damp and mould, about 15 inches, all round every room in the flat. And these people sometimes put up with it. They go, oh yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's there. How do we know we're getting to everybody? So there's a number of questions there, but uh, I appreciate your answer. In short, our objective is yes, to adopt all of those measures. And what I've tried to illustrate in this evening's report to you is that we're already sort of proactively adopting a lot of those aspects of it. So in terms of approaching if you don't mind me using the term, you know, is winning hearts and minds of our residents about how we can work more closely with them, with our residents, providing information, guidance, support when necessary. But then there's all the physical things we can do in terms of looking at the structure of the property, looking at all the external elements, all the fabric, where the down pipes are and everything else, and where the damp proof course has been penetrated, we need to get under. The, those are quite invasive and intrusive works, but that's where we have to communicate with our residents to get those works programmed and actioned. And that's what we've tried to be progressing over the past few, few months since I've been here, but certainly since last year. I've illustrated a number of examples within the report where we have adopted a much more sympathetic, person-centered approach with our residents. We've got much more robust data capture, data recording in terms of our data analytics so we know where the most prevalent properties are. We're trialing out, we're approaching residents on a much more proactive basis, so we're not waiting for residents to contact us. We know more or less, more or less, not totally, but more or less where our most prevalent properties are that have had more persistent and pervasive damp and mold courses, treatments over the past two to three years, and we're revisiting those properties. So if you like, giving the property a bit of a property MOT, all the drainage systems working, is there windows, are, are they properly sealed and working? Are the sort of the ventilation, the trickle vents, are they still in place and working? And then follow that one with some information, guidance and support to the residents as to how they can help manage the property and the process themselves. So in short, Councillor Lidyard, yes, that's our objective in principle, is to adopt those approaches. Thanks for that. Um, some years ago, um, our tenants 
prioritised kitchens and bathrooms. And in my view, I think we should have uh, prioritised damp and mould. Um, is, is it likely that we will now prioritise damp and mould? And secondly, how much do you think we should put aside in, in financial terms to get the job done properly? In terms of priority, it's already a priority within our housing asset management strategy. It's listed there as a key objective in managing our properties is to ensure we, we, we have a zero tolerance approach. But to achieve that zero tolerance approach, again, it's what I mentioned, we need to win the hearts and minds of our residents. We've got to work with our residents here. You know, it's a balance for us to be able to say, you know, not wanting to say we're coming to your home to treat this. It has to be, we'd like to come to your home. We want to work with you, you know, and identify it, address it, treat it, and give you the necessary information to help report it back to us as and when it appears. And so that's the process I think we need to adopt. You know, it will be a longer term strategy. I don't think it's going to be something we can completely tackle immediately in the next few months. It will take a, a while. Um, working with our excellence panels, maybe looking at what type of information and online resources that we can provide. Do we need to provide more online resources, leaflets, written material, uh, video tutorials perhaps? But anything that we think might help with our residents so they can have that conversation with us, report it, record it, and we can then follow up, inspect, and treat. In terms of financial resources, I think that's something I might have to defer to the director, I'm afraid. Um, yes, I'd love to have more budgets, of course, to be able to go into every property, as Councillor Bredsell mentioned, and treat them, treat the issue, rather. Um, but I'm afraid that's something I uh, have to defer. Having said that, we do have healthy budgets to, to our site, so HRA is, is still in, in, in a good shape and set to uh, deliver um, on, on sort of um, dump and malt and, and all of the asset management um, uh, activities taking place. So I, I think we, we sort of finance-wise, we, we're, we're in a good, I know, I know it's difficult to say at the moment, but we're in a good position. Obviously, we know the outcome of the rent consultation is a 7% um, rent increase that we are... Uh, uh, being sort of directed to use, which is which is sort of relatively um, good news for us. Obviously, we know the impact this might have, uh, this will have on on some of our residents, but um, at least this is this is this was the big unknown that was um, making me definitely lose sleep over HRA budget. But it's 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 looking to be um, all right. We will manage within that. Thank you. I'd, I'd I'm listening to what you said there about the hearts and minds, I think, is, is really important because when I've spoken to residents uh, in, in, in my world and, and across the, the borough, um, the, the concern is that it's always, always felt in the initial stages that the blame is just automatically on them. And then that puts, a, well, I don't want to report it because last time I reported it, it made me feel like I should have done something else or anything like that. So I do think that, that the, the fact that you know, we, we can't be uh, the, the inferring from, from blame uh, to take responsibility is, is a really important one because I think my experience, is, and I don't know, I can't speak to other members, but I'm sure it's similar that, that people can be put off from reporting it. And I think uh, Councillor Lydiard said uh, something along them lines of, of people just saying, well, you know, what's the point? And just learning to live with it. And they shouldn't learn to live with it because we just certainly don't want anybody else uh, to, to suffer with, with this if we've got the power to, to do so uh, and, and help people. Councillor Hebb. Thanks, Chair. And obviously I recognise and, and support everything you've just said. Uh, and there's one thing that always sort of strikes me. In the, in the health service, there is a, a form of independence in terms of... Um, probably heard of the patient advisory liaison service, I got that right, didn't I? PALS, um, which is, and you've got Health Watch Farrock, or Farrock Health Watch, um, which is an excellent <coughs> arrangement for someone to go to and have someone in between. And I was reflecting over the weekend after I read this report um, in regards to the um, section 4.8 on page 34 around the housing repairs quality assurance team. I'm just wondering, if we're genuinely trying to move to a point where we're changing the tone of what we do, should we be looking at some form of independence in that team 
potentially between us and our co-collaborator, whether that be Mears or whoever it may be in the future. But is that something that uh, the committee might completely disagree with me? But personally, that creating a degree of independence creates that, that trust in the system, if that makes sense. So that if you do go to this body in terms of QA, you will get an impartial view. And it, it, you, you never know, you might get 10% more uptake and, and, and so forth in terms of winning your hearts and minds over. So that's just that's one fault. Um, I do just want to positively reflect as well in terms of it's very good to see, you know, we're moving to 60-40 in terms of uh, proactive or reactive and proactive. This isn't easy, you know, having lived in the tower block and social housing for nearly a third of my life. I, I, they are interesting places if you, if you don't know them very well in terms of once you shut the door on, on the hallway in the communal area, you don't necessarily always feel comfortable sort of coming out and having a conversation, least of all about what's going on in your home. And, you know, we're dealing with 1950s engineering, which wasn't particularly great. You know, it's a totally failed concept in terms of tower blocks, as we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, so it, it's great to see that some of them work orders are coming down. I suppose my question is, is how do we validate as an organisation, how do we validate the, the quality of that work order closure? So, you know, we've got a number of work orders that have been closed, whether it be around damp treatment or whatever. How do we then go back and do like a spot sample to validate the effectiveness of it? Or do we wait for the lag indicator of somebody calling up and saying, thanks, three months later, but unfortunately, like a resident I've got at the moment, I, I need you to come back again. There was two questions there, sorry. I'll address, thank you, Chair. I'll address the latter point, if I may, first, Councillor Head. In terms of a follow-up, in the report I highlighted a trial approach on some of our most prevalent properties. I mentioned we went to circa nearly 200 surveys where we proactively contacted the property with residents. And, and that is with the prospect of going back every th three and six months' time, post we've closed the job, to say, has there been any reoccurrence? If so, which areas should we come back and reinspect? Uh, and then provide sort of necessary treatment. Again, it may be just small measures, small steps, but if there are more sort of pervasive works that need to be carried out, then they will do follow-up inspections. I, I'm afraid I think I lost track of your first question in terms of, uh, was that the independence? Was that the independence of a... It was, and I think Evelina wants to, to come right. in. <laughs> I thought that the first part will fall to me anyway. Um, I, I think it's a, it's a really good challenge, to be fair, and I quite like the sound of it. So I might actually take that away and then see if we could do something like that, more of an independent challenge to ourselves. I mean, we do have, uh, obviously, Carol, uh, sit on our uh, core group meetings with uh, Mears. Mears, obviously, are the key player here. Um, by the way, they are very happy to come and speak to you as well. Obviously, there, there's been visits arranged to their to their office that um, work Councillor Lydiard um, uh, went um, earlier in the year. So that it, it, there's definitely an element of overview, uh, but it's not necessarily quite the sort of health watch um, you know approach. So one for me to probably take away and and, and figure out. Thanks, Evelina. I mean, uh, if committee are comfortable, I, I'd, I'd quite like to lock that down as a recommendation, if everyone agrees. I um, really appreciate Evelina coming back. I, uh, we've seen the benefit, you know, in the sort of 2012-13 Care Act changes with Health Watch and stuff like that. I literally, to this day, signpost people to Kim and that team um, because it, it, it does create a genuine outcome, you know, that's based on, on, on reality. So thank you for that. No, I, I, as, as long as committee are happy with that, I think that's a really good recommendation to, to go away with. Um, so uh, I've got Councillor Redsell that wants to come in. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I don't always moan, Evelyn. But, um, just saying with Mears, I mean, we've had many meetings with Mears, and it's good if they can come here and talk to us, because I think sometimes Mears is doing, have up their game, I think, on a lot of stuff. But I think we're, we're asking them on a hide into nowhere sometimes when you're talking about mould and damp because they can go in and they can treat it and they can paint it and then we've got residents coming back to us just growing through again. So we're asking them to do things that are not possible. Um, and I'm just going to go back to Councillor Mays and I worked on something. I'm not going to say where it was or anything like that, but the flat was going to be taken out because it wasn't any good. And now I see there's somebody else's in it. So that to me is, shouldn't have happened at all. You know, it was going to be null and void and that was it because it was in 
two foot of water, people were walking about in that, and we know from that case. And now you've got somebody back in it now to saying that's not going to happen. And, I mean, we've just had a ceiling go in, in black shots and a young child with croup was in there. We couldn't find anywhere to put... I worked hard that night, and I've got to say that your lady on trying to help her out was exceptional, but couldn't, we couldn't find anywhere to put her. We had to take her to Westcliff in the end because that was the only place to get her. But the ceiling had gone in, she was in water, and the water was seeping through the fat below. You know, and there was good neighbours about to cook them dinners and things, but once that happens and we can't find anywhere to put them, she's safe at the moment, but mm. we could have lost that child with croup in that, because we couldn't find anywhere to put her. So I think sometimes we, we fall down on... When big things happen, we fall down on the small little bits, you know, that we could do. We could have been in... If that child had died, we could have been in real trouble now. Yeah. And I think that we've, we've got to learn by those cases. And I do praise Mears because Mears knows that I will go to them if I've got any problems and I will tell them if I don't like it. So I think we are giving them something to do that isn't always possible to do. You know, we're putting them in a no-go area, really, where they can't sustain. So I just wanted to say that in praise of Mears occasionally. Thank you. Um... Is there anybody else that wishes to speak on this? No? No, I think really, really good points raised tonight. I mean, the, the I know we um, we haven't done enough historically. I think we've just got to be open and honest with ourselves. We can't hide from that fact. Um, and I know it is very sad that it's taken uh, the death of a, a, a young child to really spearhead this to national news when members across, regardless of political colours, have been fighting for this issue, uh, to, for resolution for this issue for, for many years. Um, so, you know, the, the councils and, and other bodies being on notice, I believe, was the term used um, by, by the, uh, the minister, uh, is actually, um, you know, out of a tragedy, a, a good thing uh, will, will happen in the sense of our residents getting the, the service that, that they desperately need. Um, because I think we've all, we've all seen residents just crying out for help. Um, so with that, and I, I just wanted to, to question, I know you said that you're trialling one of the recommendations in terms of, was it 200 properties you sent out surveys to? I think I put some of the data inside the report, yes, around right, that, okay. so okay. Because yeah. my, my challenge would be, can that be all residents incredibly quickly? I know we've trialled it, and we want to see, but actually, um, I think that's, we, we need to use every mechanism. You know, the social media post is fine, um, but not all people have social media and all that side of things, you know. Whether or not we look at tar working with our other partners and targeting people that, that um, may get a letter and not read it. They, you know, th there's lots of different residents in there. Uh, sorry, Councillor Warren. Chair, it could go out with the rent letter. Sorry, Chair, it could go out with the rent letter. I'm sure that we'll be doing rent letters soon, you know, so... Um, it could be just a simple damp and mould survey out to council homes with the rent now. You know, if we're paying for a stamp, we might as well fill the envelope up. We'd be more than happy to try anything. We think that might work. Anything that think is going to be novel approach, we'd be more than happy to try it. Ben, can I, um, Chair, can I just say, not all council homes have got the damp and mould, though. We do have to, like, take into effect that, like, not all of them, like, my mum lives in a council house and she's got no damp and mould. So it really is, you know, um, so, you know, whilst we say we've got a lot, I think that we do have to take into context that probably a majority haven't, but the fact is that some we have got that are really bad. Uh, no, very good, very, very good points. So, Ch Ch just in case, sorry. Oh, sorry, Evelyn. No, okay. Just in case, I mean, we brought uh, Chris Seaman today, um, who is our uh, really business an analyst, analyst for uh, for housing, and we've got loads of data on it uh, in case anyone wanted. But absolutely right, Councillor Worrell, there is a lot of stock with no issues of this nature. Thank you. Can we have that in the form of a briefing note, if members are okay with that? so that we can have all that data to hand, because I think if you told us now, it doesn't 
it's not the same as having a report. So I, I do appreciate that, and that would be really handy. So in, in light of everything that's discussed, I think there is, um, add, we've adding on the recommendations of um, looking at an independent body uh, to effectively quality assure what we're doing, um, and also give residents confidence that it's not just, what we don't want is a situation of resident versus council, and we, want, we don't want that. We actually having a, a helpful friend, I think, would be, would be good. So if everyone is happy with, with that as a recommendation, and also to um, write to residents with a survey, all, all um, council tenants with a survey, and on the next possible opportunity, uh, are we all in agreement to the recommendations? Yeah, thank you. So moving on to item seven, allocations policy update 2022-23. Uh, can Ryan please re present your report? Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I'm delighted to be here tonight to present this uh, report to Housing Overview and Scrutiny Committee. Um, as you will know, as a social housing provider, we have an allocations policy which dictates and, and governs how we make lettings uh, into our stock. Uh, it's a regular piece of work that we have to do to keep it up to date. Um, this has been a little bit delayed um, due to the events of the pandemic and, and waiting for things to settle, but there are some much needed updates and additions and amendments that this report is putting forward um, for the allocations policy. The other thing that this policy follows is the housing strategy, uh, and, uh, which I presented to you in June of this year, and really focusing, as colleagues have said tonight, on that person-centred approach, taking what matters to residents, and making sure we give consideration to those things in what we're setting out. Uh, so to, to cover off some of the recommendations without going into too much detail, and I'll happily take questions on all of these, really the, one of the key things we had to do was review our financial qualification. Um, since these were last set in 2018-19, wages in Thurrock have changed, but so too have housing prices, uh, both in the rental sector and for homeowners. Uh, and you can see the, sort of the, the, the maths and the working out behind those within the body of the report to, to reach the thresholds that, that we've set today. Uh, you'll also see uh, some proposals for amendments to sheltered housing in, with regards to the age of, of accessing those. Uh, we, we've experienced some challenges previously with some of the properties, but we really think that this offers an opportunity for people who do need that housing-related support at an earlier age to work with our officers for longer, to live independently for longer, uh, and, it, and it is a, a positive, positive step. The high-rise allocations is a, a really important stage uh, and we're, we're proposing introducing a new priority for those who currently live in high-rise properties but in the event of an emergency would be unable to self-evacuate. Um, we, we do operate a stay put policy that, that hasn't changed but if a fire is in your flat or if your flat is affected by fire then there may be an expectation to evacuate. So we're proposing some changes in the policy in that regard. Uh, cumulative need in band four, so again recognising where there may be multiple needs within a household for alternative accommodation to where they currently are and, and recognising that those things matter to people and they're recognised accordingly. Uh, there are a couple of other changes which are helpful for, for officers as well as for applicants and when I say officers I, I, I don't mean just within the housing service. Our engagement for this policy was quite far ranging and far reaching. We spoke with colleagues across the entire organisation who advocate on behalf of residents who seek to join our register, care leavers, uh, vulnerable adults and, and some of the barriers that they found that the people they work alongside have, have here against and that's where you'll see things with regards to identity and eligibility verification. Uh, reciprocal offers as well for those fleeing domestic abuse and sexual violence, making sure that we recognise that properly with a dedicated section within the policy going forward. That there are other changes through here that, that do seek to make things better for, for people. There isn't really any change in here that makes it more difficult for people to access the housing register. And, and as a service, we're proud of that because we are here to support residents. It really is what we aim to do. Um, the last thing that I would say uh, just on this basis, is within the report itself, there is an appendix that we had attached, which is the draft, a working draft of the allocations policy. Um, I was, I've been quite clear with, with the chair before, but I'll, I'll be clear with you as members now. We have updated that document to show some of the changes that we're proposing. Well, all of the changes that we propose from a policy perspective. 
but it's our, our intention to continue to work on that document to make it far more accessible for residents, slim it down, take out the, the process side of things that doesn't need to be in a document like that and make it far more readable for, for the people who need to access it. So the version that you see there is indicative, but that's not what's going to be published. We really do want a far more resident-friendly, officer-friendly document. So just bear that in mind. If you do have any particular points of the policy, um, if there is anything that you see that you would like removed or updated as a specific point, then I'll happily take that feedback. But just please bear in mind, it will look radically different to what you see now. Um, and on that, I'll just pass over for any questions that the committee might have. Thank you. Um, Councillor Redsell. Where do I start? <laughs> I'm probably going to bombard you. I'm going to probably tear it apart now. Um, just a couple of bits. You've answered a bit which I was going to bring up. That at the end wouldn't mean anything to anyone. You know, nobody would actually know where it was. Um, on page 223, Ryan, you mentioned Chapel Farm, land south of Stamford Road. None of them are in the way of the Lower Thames Crossing. And Horndon Recreation Ground, I don't know why that's been put in there as part of regeneration for black shots. No, I'm not. I'm on black shots. No, this no is we're not on black shots. Oh, you're not? Sorry. No. Oh, shut up. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's for the next one. Um, just, just as a, a quick one, I just, I know you, I, I'm, I'm happy enough with the um, reducing the, the 60 plus for shelter houses down to, to 55 plus. Um, however, what I would say is that uh, I don't think we should go any lower. Um, and also, we also need to be mindful of some of these places have alarms and other costs associated because there's an assumption that they would need more help and so 55 people are fit and healthy quite often and, and shouldn't just be tarred with the same brush or charged for something that they don't need. So I'm happy enough with that personally, but I just don't think we should be charging people things that we, we don't need so uh, or they don't need because uh, I've had that as, as in Beaconsfield, uh, which is brand new, um, you know, fantastic uh, idea. But then we've, we've got people that are moving in that are under 55, and I understand the reasons why, but it, when people are moving into there thinking that they're in a 55 complex and not, that can have a, an impact on that, but, and then to be charged for things that they shouldn't. So I know it's something that you're, you're aware of anyway, but I just thought I'd make that point. Um, Sorry, I, I completely appreciate exactly what you're saying. I think, I think what's important for, for the concept of sheltered housing is it, it is less about really the age of, of those who live in it. It is about those who do require that housing-related support. Actually, someone who is below the age threshold, and, and we do have residents moving in below the current age thresholds because it is the right type of accommodation to support them. So really, that is our, our, our focus, making sure it, it is the right thing. It, is, it has got the right adaptations, the right... Uh, aids and, uh, and, and technology in there for the right people rather than the age group. But I, I take on board your points. Thank you, Ryan. Um, does anyone, uh, Councillor Redsell, did you? Yeah, sorry about that. I'm awfully apologetic because I just went past that. <laughs> I was near it already. Um, sorry, two Ryan. seconds. Councillor Redsell, can you just move the mic? Sorry. Oh. Thanks, Ryan. Do appreciate um, that. And just to ask, to page 299, 211, Band five, I thought we had actually got rid of it altogether. Why do we need it there? Because it's not actually producing anything. I just feel that we, we were going to get rid of that in the first place. I can't, I can't really see the need for it, to be honest. Yeah, I know what it's yeah. for, sheltered. Yeah, but I, just, I thought we was just gonna, it was going to go because the, in some other way you could do that. If you leave band five on there, people start thinking that band five is for a real you know, is for another purpose. The other question um, is on page 105, the stay put policy remains in place. Could you just clarify a little bit more for me? Not evacuate. Most people in a, in a block are gonna, their instinct is to get out. And I think in Grenville, people would have got out. And I think because the stay put 
and it's probably been spoke about an awful lot, and I don't even want to go down that route, because that's for other people to, to do, and not me. But I think most people are going to want to get out. And if you tell people to stay, and that's probably why we lost a lot of people in there, because they just <coughs> stayed where they were. And I think in our own flats, there's a long way to come down. You know, no way of getting the people out of there. So I think I, I just need that clarified for me a little bit more, because I don't think whether people living in the flats really do understand what that means. So if, if What I'm getting at is if they want to get out, can they? And they obviously can, because they've just got to come down the stairs. Obviously, they won't get in a lift, but it, it's. I think you can tell people to do something. It doesn't mean to say they're going to do it. You know, that's all I meant. Thank you, Ryan. Just those two, really, is all I've got. Thank you, Councillor Redsall. Uh, so on the on the band five five point, um, it, it was when when we did update the policy last, we did remove uh, applicants from band five. Band five was those with no identified housing need, with the exception of those who would be within the age criteria for sheltered housing. At that point in time, uh, we did have a, a bit of a challenge with letting some of our properties in sheltered housing for for one reason or another, and there was a, a strategic decision taken that. If people wanted to move to sheltered housing and could benefit from that support, even if they had no other housing need, that we would continue to, to support that. Uh, and I think that would continue to be the case. Sh could we look to move those applicants into another band? I, I would say not to, because, again, having a priority banding reflects that there is additional housing needs there. So I, I understand the, the confusion behind it. Could we rename it to be something else? Potentially we could look at, look at that. Um, on the stay put point um you know in recent years we we've, we've had some incidents of, of fires within our high-rise blocks um I, i'm by no means a, a technical person i've got colleagues uh, on this side of the room that might be able to step in at some point but they are built with compartmentalized compartmentalization in mind um, and they're, they're designed to be in that way the stay put is is there to keep people safe to a degree as well if it also helps people access the floors that they need to access to help tackle the fire without having residents in in, in the opposite direction coming down the stairs you are right absolutely though you, you can't necessarily tell people what to do and expect that they will do it all the time and, and human nature might ask people to do something different but we do share with our residents um, quite a handy uh, leaflet and a lot of guidance and our, and our officers spend a lot of time talking to, to residents about what they need to feel safe within their properties. We've had some real targeted work over the last 12 to 18 months within our high rises and our low rise blocks about what to do in the event of a fire. Um, I think people could argue the statement policy for a long time, but it's, it's the advice that we're giving and, and the advice that we, we share with our residents too. Councillor Diard. Thanks for your report. Uh, just a few bits of clarification really. 411, uh, for most of the last line, says sheltered housing officer also makes a courtesy call to every tenant. Is that actually true? Because I don't think they do anymore. No, they don't. They don't, do they? No. Um, Only if they requested it. Though. And I, I've also found that the duties of the wardens, there is a, a sort of base set of duties, but sometimes the... Uh, residents, they say, oh, our warden does nothing. And somewhere else it's, oh, yeah, we have great time, you know, it's fantastic. We have parties and we all meet. And and I, I sometimes think that um, something ought to be done about that, really. But just a bit of uh, clarification. Um, 611, last paragraph. Applicants with rent arrears on a current tenancy or council tenancy within the last six years, band four. I thought anybody with rent arrears, they just don't get on any band at all, do they? So if, if, I, if I take that point there, um, and again, this is very much in light of, of the housing strategy and, and that what matters most to, to residents, I think even more so in the context of where we are now with cost of living and people struggling, Despite rent arrears, sometimes the best thing to do for people is to help them to move. If, if someone is struggling to pay their rent because they're affected by the benefit cap and they're in a property that's too big for them, despite the rent arrears, if we can help them move to a smaller property where they're paying less and can access the benefits that they're entitled to, it, it's the right thing to do. Um, so so there, there may be some 
rules in, in the policy where we have discretion to do the right thing for, for people and, and we are doing more to explore those things now. So I, I would say that in response. On, on the sheltered housing point, just more broadly, again, I'm going to point back to the housing strategy. The model of sheltered housing we've had for some time. Uh, personally, I think what sheltered housing might look like in the future could be very, very different for, for the future residents coming through. Uh, I think that we have an aspiration in the strategy to look at that provision, look at what that means. Do we, do we need complexes? Can we offer outreach housing support to, to people? Um, uh, it's a piece of work that we're definitely looking to explore and, and we're committed to. So uh, I would hope for some exciting developments there in, in the coming months and years. Okay, that, that makes sense. Yeah, thanks very much. So there is some sort of discretion about rent, rent arrears. Um, I'm not sure where, the, where this fits, but I've had a number of uh, residents come to see me in the last year, and they're talking about uh, their mobility scooters. And um, having had a mum who used hers for many, many years, I realised that it meant complete freedom from their flat, from their life, to go to the shops, to have a real, you know, different sort of life. And I wonder, could you start thinking about how we can offer all of our elderly residents, I'm not sh sure that many will take this up, if we could offer our elderly residents some sort of scooter, shelter, recharging facility, because it really will change their life. It's, um, it, it's very interesting that you mentioned that point um, because there is a, a piece of work I'm actively engaged in with our sheltered housing manager to look at exactly that type of thing. To, so we have a, a good consistent approach um, because as you said, it, it can be a lifeline for people uh, and we want to support people to do that. So it is a piece of work that is currently being looked at. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hebb. Thanks, Chair, and, oh, thank you, Chair, and thanks, Ryan, for the, uh, the report. Um, page 104, uh, high rise, sorry, unless I'm being dense, uh, what number of people are we talking about in terms of number five, in terms of high rise allocations, and band four cumulatively, number six, the sort of the impacted persons? Thank you. So I'll, I'll, I'll touch on band four at the moment first. Um, it, it's very, very difficult to tell. And I say that because circumstances change all of the time. Um, so what we may have recorded on our system at, at some point, and this is the same point that, that members may have heard me make about the housing register in general, the information that was recorded at that point in time is only accurate at that point in time. It, 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 someone's circumstances could change tomorrow and their priority could go from a band four to a band one just instantly. Um, so it, I can't give a figure on that. With regards to the high-rise um, work, again, we've had some really detailed work that our tenancy management officers have been doing with our high-rise residents, um, visiting every single property, looking and asking the questions about what people would need to evacuate their property safely. Uh, I haven't come with, with that number today, but it's readily available, and I'll happily share that with you uh, by the form of a briefing note or, or, or comment outside this meeting. Thank you. A brief note to everyone would be fine. I mean, I mean, look, just for absolute clarity, you know, the full support, you know, certainly number five, you know, the fact that we're not, you know, now by strategy putting people with certain, you know, disablements or whatever into them sort of context. It, I mean, we'll look back in that in 20 years and think, how on earth did that ever happen? But look, we are where we are and thank days we're not doing, doing it again. Um, if I move on to number seven around the eligibility verification, um, what I think this kind of answers it, but there's an element around the professional verification. I suppose my question is, if I was someone professionally verifying someone's details, what safeguards do they have in place to make sure that there's no assertions <coughs> that a friend of a friend is doing a friend a favour, if that makes sense? It's more of a corporate question to make sure that there is sort of safety for our, our staff. Of course. This is where it comes down, in, in truth, to, to a prof professional accountability and responsibility. Um, when we talk about this in the terms of identity and eligibility verification, uh, you know, as a, as a council officer, if we've known someone for a length of period of time, we could be asked to sign their passport application. And it is, it's no different to that. It's thinking a little bit smarter 
trying to avoid some of the cost, the time, the the stress that comes with obtaining other forms of ID. It's the same thing with Citizen Card, for example. There are there are other ways and means that are already being explored that often cost money and time for people who are who don't have the time and the money to, to spend. So it, it does come down to professional accountability. Um, and I would imagine that should anyone be found in breach of that accountability that you know appropriate action would be would be taken. But um, we we have to trust in our officers. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Warrell. Oh, can I just oh. finish? Sorry. I have a question. Yeah. Um, sorry, Councillor Warrell. Um, number 11, extra care. Um, so I was reading the narrative here around um, about one bed flats and basically we have a surplus of two bed flats and so forth. I, is it really a question of changing the policy or changing the infrastructure? Why, what, why would we not look at... If, I don't know how long, how long has that been a problem? So th this has been uh, this has been a challenge for for a while. Um, it's it was something that was looked at at the last time this work was done and, and and before then too. In new schemes that are developed, we we take into consideration need at that point, and we are learning. In every development we do, um, we're learning about what we should be having in these blocks and what we shouldn't be having. In, you know, a, a two bed extra care property is something we absolutely should have. It's just a very small cohort of people that need that type of property uh, and because of that they quite often go unlet or unlet to thorough residents um, so there's a bit of a middle ground that we're, we're bridging here um, certainly anchor the anchor hanover operate elizabeth gardens we don't have quite so much influence on reconfiguring for example um, but certainly in the schemes that we build ourselves and we're responsible for we're far more reactive and responsive to to the needs of, of residents okay i'm not quite sure that was the, an answer but We'll go with it. And the last one is around the foster carers piece, um, which you know is something I've always supported very much so. I suppose, how do you continually review somebody's status as a foster carer to validate that exemption? No, of course. So again, this, this, is, um, this is helping to resolve an issue that sometimes happens within local authority between different services of a complex organization where policies disagree with each other. Um, we previously had a policy where if someone had been approved as a foster carer, they would be awarded the priority. Unfortunately, you can be approved as a foster carer if your property wasn't large enough. So we met with colleagues in children's services and, and tried to find the best approach. And this is if someone has advised us from children's services that this family, these um, these potential foster carers are going to approve that we would proceed with this. At the point of any letting, we review circumstances. Um, so if at the point of an offer, um, the circumstances have changed, someone wasn't eligible anymore, then, then, that, then that's no different to, to any other. But this is such a small, again, such a small cohort of people. It, it would be a handful if that, that it would be quite easy to, to keep a track on. But we do have quite detailed reporting. We are able to, to pull out at any point anyone who has a priority for any particular reason. So we could quite easily run a, a regular review of that to make sure they're still eligible in that in that context. Councillor Warren. Thanks, Chair. Um, so the first thing is the number of applicants on the housing list. I think that I think that there's a lot of more people out there that actually need housing because what we do know is that we cleared out the five you know, we used to have a five, um, a band five, and anybody that was seen living with their parents or away from home or, you know, was seen when they, you know, they was then adequately housed. So there's lots of people living that can't go anywhere near the housing list um, because of, you know, their circumstances. So I think that we have to recognise that the succession bit, which is something that I always raise, and the right to succession... We've got people that can't go on the waiting list because we've taken away the criteria. They're then living with their parents or a family member, you know, normally their parents. And then at the, that then we say, well, actually, you can't succeed that tenancy either. So you have to have people that fight to actually get housed. So I think that we, we are very, very unfair in our approach that if they don't know the system... Um, they literally could end up homeless. And I've helped a fair few people 
through that system because they've stayed at home to, they're saving us fortunes in care because they are there as unpaid carers for their elderly parents. And then when that parent dies, we say, well, actually, you can't live in there. I've, but I've lived here for 55 years, but no, you still can't live here. You know, so I think that um, there's a little bit of a double-edged sword going on there, which um, I certainly um, want to raise. And I'll always raise it when this um, report comes here, because I think it's wrong that that's what we do to people. Um, but when it comes to getting housed as well are we getting through to the right people that are getting housed and you know so we get the direct offers to the homeless applicants you know but then we've got families living in the flats you know i'm trying to support somebody now they've got four children living in two bed flat in grace because she had twins and then fell pregnant and had twins again and she's living there and she can't get out you know, um, because, you know, but because there's never nothing for her to bid on. They won't let her move into a two-bedroom because we're saying she needs a three-bedroom. You know, so we've got people that are stuck and we've got to make sure that the houses that we build are for the, you know, the right people that are coming forwards. Um, I just wondered, like, if we've got everything, you know, I just think sometimes it goes against the wrong people, you know, um, over who takes precedent <coughs> over the availability of an ever decreasing um, housing stock. Uh, thank you, Councillor Worrell. Um, on the point of succession, uh, and, and you're absolutely right to raise it, that there's an element which is legislative, um, you know, a tenancy can, can succeed once. That being said, uh, and again, I, I do keep trying to frame this in the context of, of our new way of working, and, and, and we are so proud of, of the direction we're heading in with that person-centred approach. In areas where there is an opportunity to do the right thing for the residents, we want to explore that. It's, it's a failure, I think, for the service um, if, if anyone were to, to end up homeless. You know, it goes against everything that everyone in this room stands for, really. Um, so succession is, is a very, very difficult situation. A lot of the time, because, because legally sometimes our hands are tied, but where there is discretion, I'm, I'm sure that our colleagues are looking a lot more to, to do the right thing for people wherever, wherever they can. On the point of property sizes when we build, um, again, I mentioned to, to Councillor Head, we, we review what the need looks like at, at every point in time when we've got a new development coming through. Um, uh, Heath Lynn and Claudian Way is a, is a prime example. We, we built bungalows uh, because we, there was a need for it. It's, it's not the most efficient use of land, but we knew that we needed it, and so we did it. So I would say that we do bear those things in mind. Uh, it, it's difficult with individual cases to, to go into any, any more specifics. I would always welcome your feedback if there's any areas of the policy that you think we could review for the future to, to try and get that balance a little bit more right if we're not doing that right now. Other than that, I thought it was a really well done. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Lydiard. Thanks, Chair. Um, as, a, as a former foster carer, um, I have seen occasions when people take on a foster child temporarily, move into a nice brand new sort of house, and then six months down the road, the child moves on and they don't take on any more uh, foster children. And you wonder whether that's right. Well, it's not right, is it, basically? Is there anything you can do to uh, stop that happening? Because it, it, you know, it could get a bit of a, a common thing. It's a difficult situation. Um, once, once someone has been awarded a tenancy, um, unless it's particular grounds for that tenancy to, to end, um, I, I'm not too sure that, that there is. But in order to get to that point of a priority, and again, it, this is, it's not for anyone who wishes to become a foster carer, it's, it's predominantly for those who maybe are, are in our stock already, but live in a property which is one property, one bedroom too small, that would be eligible for that type of priority um, that we'd be looking at. It, it's, a, it's a fair concern, but I think in, 
in many areas of, of the allocations policy. Sadly, if someone wished to exploit it, I, I think they possibly could exploit it, and that's one of those areas. But if a tenancy is granted, unless there's grounds to end it, I, I don't think that we necessarily could in, in that situation, I'm afraid. Okay, thanks. Just on, on that note, and obviously I, I don't know the legality part of that, but if you're giving someone a, um, a banding or, or, or a house due to a job, if you will, I know it's not a job, it's a, a, you know, my parents are foster carers. Yeah, my parents are foster carers for, for, for decades, and I know the, the, um, you know, the issues that they, good, good foster carers go through and actually having a property like this, I think, Shane, uh, Councillor Hebb hit the nail on the head. It's a fantastic policy to have, but we're right to, to raise that as a concern if, I, I don't know if we've got or able to get any statistics on that because if it is a, an, an issue, I mean, if it's a, a one-off, then you know, changing a policy over a one-off is more difficult. But what my what crux of my question is, if you're giving it for a specific reason, why is that not time limited? Is that something that we could do? In terms of being awarded that priority banding, making that time limited, or may, having the tenancy as time limited. Uh, so the, the tenancies that, that we offer um, aren't, aren't time limited. Uh, some time ago there was uh, conversations around flexible tenancies and fixed term tenancies. Um, at the point in time, um, the work that was being explored by the council was, was stopped by cabinet. Um, I'd have to check about whether they're still applicable or not, but we, we don't offer those type of tendencies, and I, I don't think that it would be wise to explore that um, in general. Evelina uh, may want I to do. Agree. I do get what you're saying in terms of the general picture. I just think if you're doing it for a specific reason, then then it's uh, it's probably advantageous to, to think, but I, I can imagine there's a bigger strategic piece on that. Uh, did you want to comment on that, Evelina? Evelina? I just really wanted to add that nationally the, um, there was a move away from debating the sort of fixed term tenancies and those that went on, on them as a sort of a bit of a trial um, have moved away from it and, and is definitely the sort of the, the direction of travel that we're getting from the government. I think the second point, I guess it's probably a piece of work to be done with sort of children's services colleagues about actually you know, monitoring that situation with the with the potential, you know, foster parent who then moves on and and is no longer interested in that. Uh, but uh, we would think that this would happen anyway uh, with them. Thank you. No, thank you, uh, Councillor Redsell. Thank you, Chair. Just something brought something up with me when Councillor Worrell was talking. Um, we had a policy a little while ago. I haven't seen anything in here, Ryan, but we had a policy or something that came through where if someone was in a house on their own, they had to downsize. Is that completely gone now? or Because we, we still have people living in homes that are too big for them. Um, so I just wondered where we are with that. Yeah, so it's it's not a policy that stopped. We, we still... Um, actually, very actively, we've we've got an officer within our within our team who is dedicated to, to help people to downsize. Um, they've been very proactive. We've we've looked at some of our data to identify some households who may be interested in in downsizing and, and reaching out to them. Uh, we have quite a, a good package of support, uh, financial certainly, but also some more logistical support with helping them move. Um, but but ultimately, it's it's down to that that individual or that couple or that household to, to want to downsize um, if you're attached to your home um, sometimes no amount of support might help you to move but we do actively try and support people to do that it is a policy we, we do follow yeah because otherwise we're going to be a three bedroom home perhaps or a four bedroom home as one person living in it and it's not going to move the council properties on is it it's not going to make them for a family did we have something that came through quite a while I'm going back a few years now we're a 10-year policy which said that if you moved into a new council home it was 10 years were we going to give people the help to move on or buy something is that just gone right okay no no so it's, we've, we've moved away from that now then yeah okay okay thank you thank, thank you yeah I, I, I it, I can understand the, the broader strategic piece on that um, in a sense of not necessarily wanting to, to time limit it, but I do 
I do see that when you've got uh, individuals that are in a three bedroom home that was designed and built for a family. And I get if that's their home and it has been their home and uh, for, for many years and have, you know, they may have lost loved ones in that property that they feel attached to. Um, however, I really think having a home that's built for a, a family, having a family in it would be massively beneficial. Um, so I don't know if that, I, I don't know if it's a legal stuff or policy or whatever, but it might be worth exploring that, especially or seeing how many we have got in the sense of um, how many three bedroom houses, two bedroom houses, four bedroom houses have only got one person in it, because then that can really steer us. Obviously, it's only a few, it's a bit different. But thank you very much. Uh, does anybody other member wish to speak? Nope. Um, so, are members in agreement with the recommendations in the report? Agreed? Agreed, thank you. So, moving on to item eight, Blackshot's estate, proposals for the way forward. Uh, Julian, can you please present your report? Sorry, Julian, sorry to interrupt. Have you got a microphone over there? Ah, I do apologise. People don't usually fail to hear me, Chair, but I do apologise. Um, so, um, uh, yes, you need to be clear on your position as against the, uh, the regulatory framework coming 2023, and the clarity of uh, decision will, will help that. There... Thank you. Uh, there has been, uh, and it's attached as an appendix to the report, uh, a initial resident consultation, and you'll see that um, uh, a significant majority of responding expressed a preference for demolition, uh, replanning, and uh, redevelopment. Um, currently, the um, tower blocks provide 168 homes, and uh, clearly, the redevelopment should ensure that those are replaced with at least a similar number. Uh, the schemes that have been drafted, and I use the word drafted very deliberately because they are indicative options at this stage, um, have all aimed to increase your number of units, uh, helping uh, provide additional affordable housing, and also broadly assisting uh, the HRA with the subsidy of the scheme. Uh, on the basis that more rent is a good thing for the assisting development. Uh, it's fair to say that there has already been a fair bit of discussion about those draft schemes behind the scenes, and it's fair to say also that there is a fair bit more work required by your consultants and advisors when they're appointed to develop a scheme that will be satisfactory to residents, members, and to everybody else. Uh, the... Um, report does set out uh, the issue of Greenbelt, uh, clearly always controversial to 
uh, permit development in the green belt and obviously the work will be done to obviate or minimise this need uh, but it may be that uh, a, a, a small take would still be required and I think it would be invidious not to flag that to you. Um, I am indebted to your property team uh, for the comments on Fields in Trust but picking up on Councillor uh, Redsell's uh, intervention earlier um, I, I think the two important things to say here one is that should ultimately you use some of the recreation ground I think then it would be a matter for you yourselves as residents and members to suggest what should be the alternatives I think in terms of the uh, indication that uh, some of these may not be uh, implicated in the Lower Thames Crossing. I did take the liberty of checking my map uh, while the uh, debate on the last item was going on and I have to say that sadly my map is not clear enough for me to enter a debate with somebody who has uh, known these sites rather better than I do. So I think uh, I can only say, uh, Chair, that I would uh, supply the committee with uh, the notes afterwards, I think. Um, and of course it might not come to that. Your design might be different that you didn't need that. Um, but um, that, that's, that's an important thing, again, to flag. Um, the most important financial commitment here is the 200,000 for the design and development of the scheme. Um, and there is set out a uh, programme for the proposed milestones. Uh, they are deliberately uh, relatively broad because clearly the design process will go on from here. It is a complicated subject, hence the nature of the report. And of course, uh, it is imperative that residents uh, are, are taken uh, along with this in a very firm uh, and careful uh, manner. Um, I, I guess, uh, Chair, I finish as I started by uh, re reminding members that you know, the imperative is here is to establish certainty, is to establish the pr pr uh, principle of development, and quite frankly, get on with designing a scheme that can resolve this. Um, happily take questions and comments and uh, obviously you're asked to uh, make recommendations for Cabinet uh, if you deem appropriate. Thank you Julian for that report. Uh, let's see, uh, first up, Councillor Redsell. No. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you for that. I do. You have answered a couple of my questions actually so I won't, I won't ask them. Um, now that's answered my little bit. Um, oh, where do I start? Um, I just feel that with black shots we don't seem to be moving on very quickly. I think we want to probably see it, as I said before, 20 years I've been fighting this one and we haven't changed much. Nothing's got any better, it's got worse. You know, 1959 they were built and you was talking about um, Green Belt. Well, we have actually taken three buildings down on Blackshots Field, so Green Belt has been given back to Fields in Trust. So a little bit of Green Belt is not going to make that amount of difference. Um, little things were done, obviously, in 212 with a five year span on it, which brought it up to 217, and we're still no further forward. Um, as I mentioned before, the, the Chapel Farm is nowhere near the, the crossing because there's a school being built on the opposite side so it's definitely nowhere near that land south of Stamford Road um, is nowhere near the crossing and Horndon Recreation Ground I don't really know why that's been put in the mix to be honest I can't see what that's got to do with that area because I don't suppose people would mind to move to Horndon you know from there but I just don't know why that's been put in the mix but the Stamford Road one and the Chapel Farm, they're right near together, so I can understand why that's been pulled in. But I... Fields in Trust are what they say. They are fields in trust. They will make representations on the field if anything is being built. We go to them if we're doing anything on the field just to get their opinion of what it's doing. They can't actually stop anything being done, but it's they're there as a consultee, just to keep an eye on it. You know, we have 56 acres over there. Um, we have plenty of land around some of those flats. So I think that that could be brought into the spec. So I would, I would dearly love to see something on paper to say we're going to do this. 
whether we've looked outside the council in any way, shape or form, or we're just staying with the council. And I can understand 168 homes, I think a few of them, 13 is it, that are leased. Um, I just don't understand why we're still, we've got problems with the flats now, obviously where the one I mentioned earlier, where the ceiling has given way and it's gone into the flat below. It's now, water's now seeping into the flat below that. So, and I honestly don't know why we're even put, thinking of putting people back in there because the danger's there already. The, the, and I don't want to go into too much. You all know where I feel. Um, I think that the damp and mould, we keep, seems to me we keep blaming the people in the flats and it isn't. 1959 building was built with no drying rooms, so they weren't built for all the tumble dryers, washing machines. The wet has got to go somewhere. And if you open a window in those high rises and you've got a small child, mm -hmm. that child will find a chair to get on, because we have had two people killed out of those windows. You know, it has happened. And I've lived near there a long time, so I can go back. But I think children will always find the way. So you're telling people, yes, open your window. Yes, it's lovely. But then you're going to worry about the child that you've actually got in that room. Um, I think we've just got to... Oh, I want to... See, in my lifetime, I want to see this come to fruition. I want to see something there. You know, it's, it's, it's just not right to, to let this three buildings, which are not fit for purpose, and we've, as a council, we've probably said that, that it's not fit for purpose. And I think that, and as, as I said to Evelina when the consultation was done, Councillor Maney and I can tell you what that consultation will be, and it was. You know, people like where they live. You're asking them if they like where they live. Yes, they love where they live. They don't like what they live in. You know, you can't say you don't like the area you live in, because you do. You know, they've got beautiful views. That, you know, they've got a big field to look out and a, a, a big garden and it, as such, but it's the building they live in. And we as a council are falling down, you know, and th well, they're not fit for purpose. I might think of something else later on. I don't want to overdo my bit and let everybody else come in. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, so just, I, I mean, I think um, only, only a couple of points really for me to respond to. Uh, I mean, certainly the thrust of this report is, is, has no intention to blame uh, anybody. This is about achieving clarity and starting on the beginning of the process so that uh, Councillor Redsell can not only see it on paper but can see it uh, in the fullness of time developed. Um, I think the other thing just to say is that um, in the course of the debate, and I guess still uh, for consideration, there have been a number of council sites examined. Um, in my time helping you, uh, there has been no consideration of private sites um, and, of course, uh, two issues on that. One is, of course, uh, the aim is to redevelop the area itself, which is partly why the, the, the uh, scrutiny, no pun intended, is being kept close. Uh, and secondly, of course, because in challenging times of build cost inflation and prices, uh, you don't necessarily want to add purchasing private uh, land to the cost of the scheme. Uh, so, at the moment, that's where that is, but no doubt, as ever, housing would look at any val valuable suggestions. Thank you for that. Uh, sorry, can I just uh, bring um, Councillor Lee Island first? I'll work more now. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Am, am I right in saying that um, you're, you're looking to sort of repair and upgrade the, the high-rise blocks to keep them going for a little bit longer so that you can then develop a plan to uh, knock them down and put their tenants into new, the new buildings. Is that true? Um, I think I would only quibble with the word uh, redevelop and refurbish, which I think were your words. Forgive me if that wasn't a complete replacement. Uh, I think what we're saying here is that rather than spending large chunks of money on doing that, we are looking to develop a scheme for knocking them down and replacing them. Uh, and But what the uh, Housing Department has to commit to in the short term is maintaining them to keep them wind and water tight and mitigate the problems as much. But what you're talking about here is not spending a large programme of money. 
Okay, that, that's fine. So, um, you know, I've, I've just been to a meeting prior to this one on the local plan and, and what uh, land is available for development and things like that. And we've also know what um, land the council has available uh, for, for housing. Um, and we also know uh, what difficult times we are in at the present moment and the possibility of having to sell our land and buildings. Um, my view is that we really ought to have some, some high level discussions um, to, to talk exactly about a plan, a project plan that the whole council agrees to, not just the housing committee, because we are looking to spend an awful lot of money. The 200,000 is just a drop in the ocean. And, you know, we're looking at 100 and, did you say 189 properties? Yeah, yeah so, you know, I mean, what's that? How much is that? <laughs> anyone, anyone come up for, is it 40 million or something like that? I, I don't know, it's, uh, it's, it's beyond me tonight, but it's an awful lot of money and I really don't think that we can make a decision here without discussing it with planning and our leader and various other people. So I think, Mr Chair, for the avoidance of doubt, uh, this report is heading of the Cabinet for a Cabinet decision and clearly uh, any scheme will be a matter uh, that will be decided on by Cabinet in the fullness of time. Uh, and of course, uh, whatever the development scheme will indeed be subject to planning committee decision. Thank you for that. Yeah, I, I, that's what I've got from this actually. Looking at the, um, the reason for the report is just to, to move forward. I know £200,000 is not going to get us uh, 160 plus homes, but, uh, which would be nice, but it doesn't. Um, and I know we need to, to put some meat on the bones of this because um, we don't want to be talking about this uh, in, in 5, 10, 15, whatever years' time, thinking, you know, this, we want to get on with this. I think, um, I think Councillor Redsell wants it built, uh, and, as, and our residents will just, just want to get a move on because they, um, they're not fit for purpose. I think it's for, 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 my, for me, and I hate to, to butt in on, on, on this and to, when other committee members want to speak, but it's, 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 it's a, it just makes sense. We just need to do it. We've been talking about it for... for, for a while, let's move forward, and, I'm, and, um, and I know it's a cabinet decision, but um, I think I'm pretty sure everybody here just wants the, the best type of homes for these residents and not just leaving them as they are. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, next, I've got Councillor Hebb. Thanks, Chair, and uh, thanks, Julian, for, for your report. And I don't think I could take any of the impassioned <laughs> views of my, my colleagues who, you know, have got walls with tower blocks in them and. You know, like I said earlier, you know, for me, tower blocks, having lived in one, or that and social housing for sort of 10 years, they are a failed post-war experiment. Um, we've, we've seen that, that it doesn't work. That isn't a FARC problem. That is a national problem, and, and wherever they may be. Um, you know, I'd, for, for one, whether we did it as part of the committee or perhaps we could just arrange it or whatever, I wouldn't mind as part of the committee going and having a look at some of the, the, the issues at hand firsthand. Um, it would be helpful to see. Um, you know, looking at the evidence that's articulated in the report, you know, more on the appendix, you know, it, it isn't everybody, but it's a very, very strong <laughs> indication of the viewpoints, and it's relatively balanced, if memory serves, in terms of the three different blocks. Um, so, so for me, the will is there. The question is, is the skill. Um, <laughs> this council has embarked on a number of significant projects over times gone past. Um, and hasn't always gone exactly to plan. So I suppose my question now is reflecting on that, what, what will be different this time? Because I think members need a degree of assurance that lessons have been learned um, and frankly, that this project would be different because when we are talking about 169 homes and families within, this is not something that can keep going over and over and over. So Chair, I'm not sure I'm best qualified uh, to comment on what may or may not have happened in the past and maybe housing colleagues would want to talk about lessons learned. But in terms of the development that would be proposed here, um, you are talking about uh, appointing advisors to do the design for you. You are talking about 
uh, advise us to help the tenants through this process because this is a central plank of what we call estate regeneration that you your tenants have advisors to help them uh, in terms of being comfortable with the specification and being in terms of uh, the movement decanting in and out of the properties um, and uh, obviously you will uh, uh, work through both your own officers and uh, other officers uh, other advisors I should say uh, in terms of uh, managing the project uh, when you when you get to that point in time uh, so um, certainly you would build and equip a team of uh, uh, of high quality people to do these projects and um, it would be wrong of me uh, based on my increasingly long years and gray hairs to say these were straightforward schemes they're not they are extremely complex uh, and they do take management um, but i think you have the opportunity uh, by setting out on that um, uh, on that journey and achieving clarity to deliver that good scheme and uh, just picking up on councillor Lyd lydiard's point which forgive me i didn't mention but a good quality project plan and a good quality program is a central part of that i don't know evelina whether you wanted to add anything on in terms of lessons learned because i think that'd be un unfair for me to comment I, not not that i um that i can actually um add straight away i mean i i do think that Obviously, we we talking about the principle of of of, of demolition and and redevelopment, and that the sum of sort of two hundred is is what we absolutely need in order to buy in that expertise to help us to deliver and shape the the the, the scheme. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Just as a on in terms of lessons learned, and I know this is kind of a us us given. Um, our view on the, the, the steer to, to do this project. Um, we have got uh, a project, a, a thing on the next work program uh, for our next meeting for lessons learned on Calcutta, uh, on the Beaconsfield Place and Calcutta Road. So actually, um, it'd be a good time to have a look at that and look at what went wrong and how we can how we can make it better. So with projects like this actually go ahead a lot more smoother. Um, Councillor Hebb, did you want to come back in? Yeah, I do. And I don't think there's any, I mean, unless I've read the room completely wrong, I don't think there's any question around going to get the conceptual piece of work. Respectfully, I've had Gantt charts in front of me, I've had assurances in front of me, and frankly, there are still projects that are still yet undelivered, which is not acceptable. Now, I'm not saying that that is the housing department's problem, because it isn't necessarily, um, or it isn't categorically. Um, but corporately was talking about the I think it was Ryan earlier on who said about the the corporate entity that we are is frankly the name on the tin is for borough council so we do need assurances and I do think we need to not relent on that um, uh, who is the Forest council project sponsor for this ah excellent so that's that's good um, I, I think the key for me Evelina is is that we do reflect on, and I, I get your point around looking at the major projects, but uh, the prior projects that I think it's your report, Ryan, isn't it? Next month or next two months, whatever it is. The key is is that the scale of the projects needs to reflect this. You know, we're we're not talking about a, you know development of several houses. We are talking about something. In far as I'm aware, this council has never ever done. No. Yeah. This is gigantic, it's exciting, and it really thrills me, nearly as much as my beloved colleague over here. But it is huge, it's monumental, it's going to take massive upheaval, and I know you all know that because you're all sitting there nodding at me, but we've got to make sure this is done right. Um, and that is beyond just having a Gantt chart on the wall and stuff like that. It does need proper ownership and capability, and I do think we do need a, a conversation later down the line at what that looks like because we can't have a repeat of the past. One other just quick last point, and it's really quite minor in the grand scheme of things. The consultation, um, it's about a five-week consultation, and it's going to happen in winter 22, which I haven't put my heating on recently. I think I, I, it's, we're there. Um, we're looking at a cabinet decision in Q1, so that has to be by default by the middle of March. Is that enough time to use 200 grand's worth of consultation and everything to, to get that back? Just to be clear, you aren't using 200 pounds on cons 200 grand, sorry, on consultation. That's only a part of that. Um, the, the the 200 is going to design, uh, etc. Um, I think, to be honest, you 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 uh, um, you are embarking on an ongoing consultation process, and I don't think you should necessarily see that as 
a defined period. Because from here, one of the roles of the independent tenant advisor is to be that, uh, they used to call them tenants friends at one time, uh, to be that ongoing um, source of advice, source of uh, relationship with uh, the tenants. And also to facilitate and um, uh, conduit their concerns into the council. And so I think um, it's probably better seen as, a, uh, as, a, as an ongoing process on which you're now embarking. While I have the floor, Chair, just very briefly, your point about uh, the resources and the management and what that looks like, um, I think, I don't suppose there's anybody on this side of the table who would disagree with that, but I think you're also right about the right time. I think your imperative, quite frankly now, um, is to, uh, uh, to achieve the clarity that you're going to demolish them and then face the various hard questions about where this scheme is and what it looks like. Um, and, and then that's the point at which that debate is very relevant and very real. Thank you. I've got Councillor Worrell. Thanks, Chair. Um, so I'm pleased to see that we finally got to this stage. You know, I think that we've been round the houses and um, something that um, Joy and Ben have been pushing for for so many years. So I think that to ask us for this money, you're pushing on an open door because we want to see this happen um, and we want to see it happen as soon as possible. But I think that we do need to, um, to acknowledge that, you know, we've got a housing development strategy that's kind of stalled. You know, we're not, build, we're not building anything. And um, two years ago, we agreed a housing development process and we haven't got anywhere. I mean, we talked earlier about the housing waiting list. Now we're gonna stall the housing waiting list because we've got 160 odd families that need to be decanted out of flats and we haven't got anywhere to put them in and we're not building anything to put them in. So all of the people that are stuck in the homes already are still going to be stuck because these will take priority, I guess, when we decide to move forwards. So we're, we're creating ourselves a little bit of a, a snowball of um, problems straight away. Um, and because I, I kind of remember that when we did this, the consultation, not all these people wanted to move back. They want to move out. You know, they don't want to be decanted out and come back. They want to be moving across Thurrock. So we've got a bit of like, so that is part of the consultation and the bigger picture. We're not just saying to everybody, right, I'll move out next week because, well, we ain't got nowhere to put you. So um, we've, we've got a bit of an issue. So it is a much bigger thing and we need to, and I know that there's a recession and building costs and everything like that, you know, it's going to be difficult to build any homes. Um, so we need to, as much as we want to pull these down, we have to acknowledge that it's a difficult time and a difficult world for us to be embarking on this big, massive redevelopment at this current time. But I do want to see the consultation happen, but I think that we need to acknowledge it's not next year that we're doing this, probably. So, I mean, very briefly, Chair, um, I mean, I think the, uh, the point is well made that obviously, uh, you know, there are wider implications. Uh, the, the, the development, um, I mean, I think there's two things to say. Of course, one of the things I've been helping you with is a development strategy. Um, that has taken longer than it was perhaps originally envisaged. And one of the pr principal reasons for that, of course, is that the world has kept changing over the last uh, uh, few months. And uh, it's also that reason why uh, the, the uh, development process might at least give the appearance of having stalled. Um, but I think um, it, it would be wrong to ignore the, uh, I'm trying to think of the right word, turbulent times in, in, which, in which the development and the building industry currently is. Uh, but in terms of the need to increase uh, numbers uh, and, and obviously the potential effect on your allocations process, uh, I mean, the point is well made and I can't really add great deal more to it right no thank you thank you for those answers um i'm just looking at the time we've got 15 minutes of allocated time i think we're pretty much in agreement i think it's just um making comments and and um points what i would say is i've, I've got um councillor redsell and councillor lydia that, that wish to comment but 
I think if we can try and keep that so that we um, finish on time, please, because we do have, well, we've got the work program afterwards. I think there's a few bits on there, but yeah, if we could, uh, Councillor Redsell first. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I won't go enough what you had to say, but I just, consultations are fine. I think what we've done now is the consultations we've done, we've given people hope. Yeah. And that hope gets dashed, you know, because we are not living up to our standards because the people are living in grave places, you know. They're not meant to be in there because they're just not fit for purpose. Um, uh, yeah, I, I just really wanted to... I just hope we're not going to go in there and do another consultation with the residents saying, do you want to whatever and do you want to leave here and everything else because I think we've already given them that hope. We've done the place in Chadwell St Mary which on a council's point of view that is, that is coming back as something good that the council's done. Mm. You as, as the council officers have got to put that in a good context because that's all you get back is good feedback for those 53 homes that got built mm. on that site and when I see in the report about we're thinking of making six storey flats. No, I'm not taking 11 down to put six up. You know, I don't care. Three is enough. You know, if you give people, at least give people a balcony, because those ones in Chapel are absolutely beautiful. Yeah. You know, it looks nice. It's got greenery. It's really lovely. And if you can do that, only one block's going to come down at a time. We aren't going to take the three whole blocks down and, and because we couldn't do that. It's an impossibility. Um, so one has to come down at a time. Um, I, d I don't know how we do it, but we have to do it because, to be honest, I don't want another year of having this with all the complaints we get and everybody that's not happy because, to be honest, we are going to have something happening. If you look at those, I think it's Keir Hardy flats, if you look at the wet is coming down the walls now, running down the walls, and we are going to have a fatality Mark my words in there, and I can't be, say that stronger. We are going to have something happen in there, and then we'd have perhaps wish we'd have moved a bit quicker. But I just want it to move, please, forward. Thank you. Very, very briefly, Chair. Um, I, I hear what Councillor Redsell says about uh, having lower and lower eyes. Uh, I dare say that um, uh, planning policy might support that. Uh, I think it's a bounden duty to just point out, of course, that the lower eyes you have, the more your land take. Um, and I think it'd be invidious of me not to say that. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, Councillor Lid uh, Lidia. Very quickly, thanks, Chair. Um, it's a £40 million pound project, I would say, or give or take a bit either way. Um, given the resources, I would knock them all down tomorrow. Um, there are other local authorities have, who have knocked down high-rise blocks, and I can take you to um, Newham, where they're still trying to decant people, I think it's 10 years after they agreed to <laughs> empty the block. So there's, there's lessons to be learned, and I think if we can find one or two local authorities that have done this, we can learn a great deal, save ourselves a lot of money, and maybe get it done quicker. Thank you. Very good points. Um, I think that we're all, it sounds like we're all in agreement. So I, uh, so our members in agreement to recommendations in the report, which is 1.1 .1 to 1.6. Have we agreed? Brilliant, thank you very much. So, item nine, the work programme. Uh, I believe Councillor Hebb asked for something on the work programme earlier. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Just a, a personal reflection. When I looked at the work plan, you know, a few weeks ago, I was, I was somewhat surprised that there was nothing talking about the Ukrainian set resettlement in Farrakh. Um, I, I, I would, I did expect it, but it isn't. And I, 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 there's a, a few residents in my ward who uh, have, uh, who are members of the settlement scheme. Um, and our hosts under that designated scheme. And they've raised a number of things with me. So I, I think, for, Jenny, for the benefit of the work plan, provided everyone agrees, I'd like an update, please, on the Ukrainian resettlement programme and the future of that, please. There's just... If, uh, what, sorry? 
Oh, no, a report to committee, please. Um, I, I know the March one is um, relatively light. The one thing I would say is that we are coming up to, we're not quite, but we're coming up to the 12 months. And at the moment, there's a little bit of uncertainty. So speaking to some hosts in my ward, um, there is a, a risk, uh, there is a bit of anxiety emerging around that. So whether we can squeeze it into next month or not, I don't know, I'll let someone else take that view. But there's just a few matters around that, speaking to, to the host residents in my patch. Um, one is a, like a conversation around what Farrock is doing from a pastoral sense for people that have come over. Um, obviously, you know, things like how does the NHS work? How does school entry work and all that sort of stuff? And there's like some assurances that that is happening. Um, or, or what opportunities there are that, that we need to take further. Um, in terms of hosts, you know, understanding their responsibilities, you know, do they have clarity on their obligations? I mean, when this was happening, this was done very quick with, you know, there was due diligence, let's be honest, but it happened pretty quick. And nine months in, I think there's been lessons on all sides in terms of, you know, some people, the, the, the whole dynamic of the household has probably evolved. So, you know, are there any welfare visits required to make sure that both hosts and guests are, are, are adequately looked after? Um, what else is there? Uh, job centres we can talk about later. But the one thing I would ask, and I, I don't know whether it comes from Evelina's department, but is some clarity where possible, because I understand this is a moving feast on the whole 12 month piece, um, because obviously this was originally a, a one, end, one year piece, um, and there are hosts that are starting to ask, I don't certainly myself, questions on, on that. All right, so I don't know what the committee think, but that's yeah, my thing. No, no, I think that's. Everyone seems to be nodding, so yeah, if we can add that one, please. Uh, Councillor Warren. I think Evelina also wanted to come in, sorry. I was just going to add that um, we, uh, so, so most of the early um, of sort of settlements reached to six months, sort of about two months ago, um, and we've agreed, I don't know if you're aware, additional funding, um, just from within the sort of the grants that we get from the government, to tie people over the winter, so in recognition of the increased sort of cost of living um, and all of those pressures. We have been awaiting a statement from the government that the thank you payments would be upped and that the, the sort of the, the uh, that there will be a sort of a, a push to really um, extend the scheme. The scheme is for three years, so I think it's it's three years. It's is the sort of um, is the minimum. The funding at the moment is for year one only. So so we're just sort of waiting to hear from the government. We think that it, it will get extended to cover the whole period of three years, so that shouldn't be a problem. Um, but yeah, we we're happy to pick up that report. Um, I think in March, to be to be frank, because the January timescales with the approval of those uh, reports, the officers would need to be sort of finishing drafting right about now for it to make it to January committee, but March, if that's okay. Um, good, absolutely, would welcome that. Councillor Warren. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to see a report come through on um, the role of estate management and the teams. Um, so what work they do to check um, their estates um, I could take you to a good few estates, short housing blocks, um, low-rise flats, all sorts, you know, and I'm not sure that the role of the estate officers um, is being done as efficiently as it should be. And then when we pay contractors a lot of money to do a job, um, and I'll pick this up with Evelina outside of here. I believe we've paid somebody a lot of money to do a piece of work, and it bugs me every single day that I look at it. And nobody's, and I keep, and I ask the workman, are you coming back to finish that? <coughs> don't know, this is, I've only got to do 25 metres, you know, like, and they don't care. They literally don't care. As long as they get their bit of money. And I think that this, um, I just think that it looks like we don't care about where our residents live. So I'd like to see some sort of report about what the role of the estate officers are um, and how often they actually go out and police whether people are doing things like oil changes in the roads and um, lots of things that are going on that I see. Um, I'd like to... I don't quite know what their role is anymore. I think I used to know what an estate officer does, 
but I'm not sure that I know what an estate officer does um, and how their managers check that the estate officers do their job. So I'd like to see something come forward in March for that before the end of the year. It'd be really good. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Moore. No, that's a very good point. I think that's something that I've had, I think most of have had to, to, to look at recently. And I think I've even asked that for our members' inquiries as well, just to, 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 I know it sounds a bit silly when you say, what does someone do? But actually, it's a relevant question. Um, Councillor Redsell. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I th I th just picking up on Councillor Worrell's part, yeah, we, I've got properties in my area where they're not even looking after the front of the house. It's just rubbish everywhere. And when you've got somebody living either side of that house, that puts their property down because they're not looking after. I just wondered if there's picking up on that. Where I don't think sometimes the housing officers come out often enough to check it and, and don't go back to the property and say to the people sorry this is your home you should look after it or take care of it you have been given a council house so I think I'd be very happy with that but I'd like it to cover further than that it's the estate not just the houses I mean the white lines the curbs the potholes the spraying that don't get done properly it's the whole shebang that we use HRA money for um, because other departments call on the HRE to, to pay for stuff because there's council houses there. Um, so, and I just think that we should have lovely estates, really, but um, I can take you to a good few that are not right across Thurrock. Thank you. No, I, I, I agree, and I think members all seem to be nodding away at that one. So, yeah, if we can add that as, as well to the March run. Uh, I think we... so. We've got the Ukrainian settlement scheme um, uh, and the role of an estates manager team. Um, but the other one I picked up from earlier, uh, just to make sure for clarity, was the HMO strategy. So we need to add that to the, the, the March one. So, yeah. so that's that. If, if there isn't anything else, I think that's, that's it. So with that, I shall, uh, that concludes the business of the meeting this evening. I now declare the meeting closed at 9.27 p.m. Thank you.